<laughs> like when you really think about how rich you would be if yeah. you could go back and do what you did. Even if you could go back six months. Facts. You know, and that's the problem is that when you're 16 and you have all the marketability and the youth and the energy, et cetera, yeah. but you don't know anything. Yeah, you're just kind of running blind. <laughs> yeah. Like spend it all on. I don't, what would I have spent it on if I was, like if I had like, major money when i was 16. right because have you always been this sort of obsessed creative like when i'm reading about all the stuff that you're into it feels like you're this like fountain of creative energy that's just going in a million different directions is that always kind of been the case yeah like i my earliest memory of creation i would have been about four years old and i remember like i do all i remember is it being mad noisy and I had this really quiet moment where I was drawing and the world felt fine. Mm. Don't remember what I was drawing. Don't remember like, if it was any good. I just remember the action of it always kind of felt comfortable. And then like throughout the rest of my time on this planet, um, I just kind of treated it like whatever I was meant to do next, I was meant to do because it all contributes to this greater idea of it being art. Mm. And it's like the same reason why like nobody likes being labeled in terms of genres or or having any kind of labels on them whatsoever, it's because it instantly restricts you when in reality, while you start creating anything, it is so that the possibilities can keep growing and you can grow with it. So mm. yeah, like I did everything I was doing. I started with illustration. Um, my sister's a dancer, so she got me into dance when I was like nine. I danced until I was 19. And you were you were born in London or, yeah, or in Ghana? In this area, this, okay. this is literally, the area where everybody comes to for everything is where I grew up. But are your parents are like first generation immigrants? Um, yeah, they're, so for they're from Ghana and then they moved over. They met here, but they're both from Ghana. Oh, okay. They both migrated at different times and met and collaborated and made me. What kind of upbringing did they have you with? Like, did, were they understanding about you yeah. having these crazy creative impulses? Yeah. I mean, like, they're supportive within their understanding. And I think certain things they didn't understand, I'm grateful that they didn't let me go down. <laughs> right, yeah. I remember at one point I had like an all right paying job and I came in and told my mom like, I'm gonna quit that and be like an assistant at a gallery. And she goes like, what do you mean? I goes, you know when people help you understand the painting? She goes, you wanna quit your job to go stand somewhere for free? <laughs> <laughs> You're an idiot, <laughs> like just let like, it calm down, in it? But um, she's never stopped me from doing anything because like the, the, I always understood balance. If I was going to do a madness outside, a madness on road or whatever, the, the, the home has to be cool. Home can never be affected. If, if I wanted to go off and do a bunch of creative things, cool, make sure the education was patterned. You feel mm. me? So I went university, I finished with a first, like I finished like top six in my university. Wow. And then as soon as I was done, I just said to her like, yeah, I'm doing music now. And like, that was another weird one. Cause like, and I, I wasn't musical. Right. I wasn't the musical kid that was like, Mom, buy me a piano, buy me this. That. When did that kick in? After poetry. So okay, around, I was right. in college, I was writing poetry. Um, How'd you get into that scene? Because I've been to a lot of poetry recitals and shit in, in LA, and it's yeah. definitely like its own, its it's own its world. Own thing, yeah. yeah. It was definitely, when I was like, when I was going to see it and visit it and fall in love with it, it was definitely its own thing. Right. It was like, we had credible, notable scenes and names and people to like aspire to be like, and all of a sudden they were black. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? So like, it was really like a big thing like to see somebody come from the ends that you come from using poetry to escape the ends. Right. You feel me? So like, I remember when George the Poet first got signed, it was like a huge thing. Like when Sully Breaks got a million views and now all of a sudden Will Smith's in his videos and stuff like that. Mm. My man's from North London, you feel me? Like right. really there, you get me? We could walk outside and see him and now he's like doing bits. So I remember going to that, that, like those kind of things, mad young jumping up there, trying to do what I was doing. And it was like working, I built a little name for myself. Um, <clears throat> but like, I never felt fulfilled doing one thing. Mm. It was like, right, I've got poetry. How do I now make people see the poetry? Okay, let's do these like short films, like these creative films or whatever. Mm. Um, like, let's just make it interesting because the the stigma is that it's dry, isn't it? Let's just be real. 
Yeah, but that's the crazy thing about it is that when you think about poetry, the reason why it's a hard sell to a youth is that it has a lot of the same characteristics of hip hop. If you're into one, you might be into the other, yeah. but then poetry just has a much smaller scale, but at yeah. the same time, it's more accommodating to, you know, the values of it are less in the sense yeah. of that in rap, it's kind of like, well, if you're not doing numbers and making money, then you're you're supposed to be irrelevant. You're supposed yeah. to not really be all that important. Whereas in poetry, you know, it's more judged on the work rather than yeah. in rap. It's like judged on the, the result. Yeah, 100%. And I think that was the confusion for people when I started making music because my approach to music was came from how I approached art, which was like be inspired and then create. So it wasn't like I have to be the hardest this and the hardest that. And like I was just trying to make a good product. Um, so when you listen to it, it didn't sound like anything else. It didn't sound like what you would typically hear. So you had to interpret it. And then the argument was, oh, he's not a rapper, he's a poet, or he's not a poet, he's an artist. He's... And it was confusing for a long time. I right. think for a lot of people, the first four years would have been that. Do you know what I mean? The first four years would have been like deciding whether I was a music artist, if I was a poet, if I was a this, that, and the other. But like for me, I didn't give a fuck. I just cared about being good, didn't it? Right. Like if I was good, like at the end of the day, there's no MC, there's no artist, there's no music artist from nowhere that's ever met me or heard my stuff that can't tell man I'm not one of the special ones. Like I'm not a chosen one. You get right. me? That was my concern. The numbers, the money, all that stuff. I always knew I'd have that. I'd get that. You get me? So uh -huh. it was like the third concern in the list. It was like, all right. So how, but how do you make that transition over to doing the music thing in, in your particular case? Like when I was looking at your shit online, what really stood out to me is just that you've got videos that are clearly like concerned with politics and socioeconomic situations and then also you know you're, you're tying the rap into like clearly you had something to say politically yeah. that you weren't going to just start making rap and then sort of leave behind all your concerns that you had previously yeah 100 percent. i think at the time especially i only really knew how to write from what i was going through and in in england there was these massive political shifts and these like these things as a young black man growing up you start to realize that you are responsible for certain things and kind of have to say something um not in a way that's preachy not in a way that's like if you don't believe this and if you don't think this you're wrong but more like you're confused i'm just as confused as you are mm. but we all got to grow through this do you get me so like yeah. it started to become a more of a commonality rather than it being like a political like point in this point in that because like for example one of the videos i remember got picked up by um black lives matter and um, cause at the end I had a scene where I was holding my nephew and I was painted completely black. Um, and he's holding a sign that says, um, my life matters. And like, I, when I, when I wrote that scene down and I've said it to the guys or whatever, and I'm like, this is how we're going to do the scene. My concern wasn't the political, like, like reference in that sense, or like who's going to pick it up or whatever. My concern was when my nephew watches that in 10 years, 15 years, when he's older, if things haven't changed, he needs to know that message. Mm. He needs to understand that. So everything became way more personal. Like, and then kind of opening a door over it. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. saying, all right, have a look. You get me? It's weird, man. Like, I don't know why half of this stuff came out the way it did. It just... I was just creating it as I felt it. So you do everything with the videos, like you're actually like scripting out like what the different scenes are going to be and stuff. Yeah, I have an I like I have an amazing team, and I like uh, with everything else that like, I would like hold the mantle on and say yeah, like ah, oh, creative director, artist, da, 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 blah, blah, whatever the list is that people right. see. With directing, I've directed videos, but I always give the credit to the people around me. Do you know mm. what I mean? Because they facilitate the ideas. I'll come. I'll have things in my head that are like just rattling around in there yeah and um but that's kind of the, the process that you have to figure out as a as a creator at yeah. some point is how to take some of the duties and put them in other people's exactly. hands or you're never gonna get anything done like lewis and alex amazing directors they was working with me during the early part of my career they actually branched off and ended up managing well lewis manages um slow tie okay um and has massive success massive massive success with slow tie and like literally nothing makes me prouder. Do you know what I mean? Like seeing people have come up and come up around, um, really just take it to the next degree. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Charlie D. Placido, Craig MPH, like 
just all these like people that I just keep around me that I'm like, yo, do you know what? Let's just keep making the future. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's what's up. So, but you have a lot of different shit going on besides just the music. And you try to like yeah. summarize everything that's going on in your universe. Yeah, I'm like, I'm. Do you know this? Is my advice to young people is do everything. Yeah. And then when you get older, you'll find a way to just simplify <clears throat> it because you realize there's there's a lot of time in a day, but it's not that much time in a day. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, creative direction is something that I, I still operate. At, uh, what's it called? Chelsea Bravo? Do you know, I haven't worked with Chelsea oh, Bravo okay. in a while. She was the first person. That comes from, basically, Chelsea was the first person to ever give me the shot. Do you know okay. what I mean? Like, I hail her up to like the end of time because like she discovered me. Well, we discovered each other when I was just coming out of university. And she could tell I had a skill or an eye for like art direction and creative direction. And I, was, I went to fashion school. I went to London College of Fashion um, and graduated in uh, illustration and creative direction. Uh -huh. So when I come out, I was like exploring all of the stuff to do with music. She was helping me with some of the fashion things to do with that. And then it kind of subsequently I ended up helping with the brand. And we took it like super duper far. She took it, um, relocated to America. She's doing amazing. Um, and like now the brand's kind of gone in the direction of um, kind of more unisex fashion because before it used to be strictly menswear. Right. Um, but yeah, after I kind of stopped doing that, I was way more in the, the world of kind of like collaboration. So I'd partner up with different brands, come in for a little bit, work on a project and then like, do you know what I mean? Like, Is menswear the, the stuff that you were mainly interested in when you were in uh, fashion school? Do you know what? More yes. More proper yeah, type stuff? Yeah. I think I was more interested in what people could make and why. Mm. That was it. Like, like I. everything has a purpose. Do you know what I mean? So, in one sense, like, something as simple as a t-shirt can be designed 50 million ways mm. for it to, like, have a new purpose or, or serve something in something else, like, in, in another way. Um, like, even when you look down to, like, the layers on a on an army uniform throughout different like ages mm. there's so many things that you can pick apart now that just become like individual fashion trends mm. like everyone nowadays are wearing holsters and all that kind of stuff but all these shapes and these designs come from reference images from products that were designed with purpose right do you know what I mean so that was my obsession was like what was the original purpose and like how do we keep it true to that but then now start to explore how it now works for a, a person in a modern age right. where they're not out at war or they're not like on a farm or they're not like where half of these shapes, like these actual fashion shapes and these trends come from. I never really thought about it like that, but there is such a weird military element in a lot of the shit that's trendy right now. In yeah. the sense, of everybody wearing the fake bulletproof vests yeah. with the pouches everywhere and shit. Yeah. And even like more in a, like a year or two ago, on Melrose, where my store is, everywhere you'd look, you'd see people rocking the fucking million different color camo, yeah, yeah, which again yeah, yeah. is like this weird bastardization of, yeah, of military shit. Yeah, it's so strange. And like, it goes in and it comes out. and like, Yeah. But like, it happens with everything. And like, even down to women's wear fashion and things like that, like all these styles and shapes and like, they just happen in cycles. You mm. know what I mean? Like even prints and, and like, just color trends and silly shit. Like it just, keeps happening in cycles and it's like, it's interesting. I can see why celebrities lose their minds when they get to a certain point and they've got all this money and they want to start their brand. Mm. Like, like it's hard to get into it because it's like, there's the interest in it. Do you know what I mean? As a consumer, you're interested. Mm -hmm. And then as a creative, there's something you want to add to anything that you, do you know what I mean? Like touch or interact with you. There's always an idea because your, your mind doesn't relax. Mm. <coughs> And then in theory, you should be able to like, just do. And you actually can. It's now the approval thing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Which was like, my hesitation with everything to do with like music and the industry. And why like, even for those first four or five years, like, I was so unconcerned with the fame is because like, I kept saying, who am I trying to please? Mm. I'm happy I made it. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. I made, this didn't exist before. It exists now. Happy days. It's crazy. 
to think that the challenge in fashion for many, many years was just to be able to figure out how to make stuff. Yeah. Now the, the information pipeline is so much smoother that it's like if you want to make stuff, if you want to make a t-shirt, it's really no excuse for you to not be able to yeah. figure out how to make a t-shirt. And then the challenge becomes how do you make something that could stand out versus all the five million other brands that yeah. are making t-shirts yeah. and that fact that everybody's being overloaded yeah. with information at all times and things become uncool so fast. So and, quickly. Yeah. So quickly. It's like you could and that's that's the saddest part about seeing a lot of like like I'll see a lot of young designers come up now and they'll spend years to, and I always say it's too like just think and do. Like if if you're within your means, think and do. Because they'll spend a long time creating these ideas and these shapes and it's whatever and then somebody will just make it. Mm. Because like as much as it was your idea you are not the only human being in the world capable of conceiving that idea. Do you mm. know what I mean? So for whatever random set of coincidences that flew past you, that made you think of that, it can happen for somebody else. And it might if you wait too long. Exactly. When it does, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> like, like, there, there's this guy who was selling these these necklaces that I saw uh, in America at this festival we went to, and they're, they're, they look like like real jewelry, but then it's like the pieces are made out of like uh, clear plastic. Yeah. So it looks kind of cool and stuff. And I was looking at it, and as soon as I, I and you know, I, I was listening to some of my friends talk about it, as like they were saying, oh, he needs to make it more limited. He should only give it out to like X amount of people and stuff. And I started to think like that idea is so easily replicable that it's like he needs to understand the shelf life of what he has yeah, here yeah, yeah. and push it to the appropriate to the degree and, and, and then move on and then that's why you end up with and, and really what is the gain from that like yeah you can make money in the short term but the real gain is that you're going to add to your profile like your your audience yeah. that will be able to then perceive your future ideas because and that's why a lot of brands now start out with the idea of being a sort of temporary brand yeah. that they're going to do for a couple of years and then they're going to move on gonna because the challenge of keeping a brand cool for 20 years is ridiculously difficult and and it's almost impossible so many guess. perils that go along with that and it's like to a lot of people it's like well i know i can make something cool for that's why you gotta like, salute brands like trap star like because i remember trap star from like when i was in school and like it's weird because like i use them as an example of a modern day heritage brand mm. do you get me so like when you think of heritage brands now, you think of all the ones that are kind of operating and tailoring and kind of like the old, kind of like more suiting and all that stuff that have existed from like the 50s or whatever. Mm. But actually all that is, is a particular style existing over a generation and that's still being special to that generation. Mm. So there's a lot of streetwear brands that have lived with people. Do you know what I mean? And they've now kind of graduated to the next point in their career but they're still not seeing themselves as a heritage brand, as something that has been a p part of people's lives. Like when I was downstairs, I was looking at the shoes and I saw one of the Air Forces had um, one of the college dropout teddy bears on it. And I was like, yo, um, it was easily in school when that came, easily. Like I was, I remember having my backpack on, begging my mum for a Ralphie Poli, right. like Polo or whatever and like, I just re I remember it so vividly. Like I remember him doing um, the feature verse on um, is it Slum Village? I don't remember. You don't remember? And he had the pink polo on, and he was walking hella oh, quick. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. walking hella fast. I remember that video so clearly. Right. Like things like that start to become like part of the heritage of like style and fashion, and like you start you see it. Like you're walking through London, there is a very particular sense of style, but it is quite worldly. Do you mm. know what I mean? like, comes from everywhere yeah so do you see your music as being like a direct reflection of your interest in fashion like how do those two overlap and, and work together um i don't think do you know what? they don't really overlap until you get to the videos or the visual mm. content where you're trying to tell the story right I think, um, like part of the process of getting into music was like hey i didn't i didn't like my greatest fear was like being one of these Donnies that just jumped into it to jump into it mm. for it to be like the way out like sick innit like, if it's the way out hard but I wanted to be good do you feel me like at music like making music so the process of making music became about everything do you know what I mean it became about how people felt what they saw mm. how they interpreted it what it meant to them in the long run and all that kind of stuff um, 
and fashion is a part of that like even down to when you think about like when you're about to make merch right it's like you gotta think of what font actually describes the sound of music right that you're referring to damn near everybody's a fashion designer if you want to include merch in there these days because that's like everybody's first foray into doing anything that people are gonna wear people go crazy on merch but it's sick man i love the fact that people are going crazy on merch right now yeah octavian just dropped those um bowler shirts with the endorphin print on it Uh fire like you get me like (laughs) fire i'd cut that do you um? But how do you feel like your music fits into the overall like world of UK rap? Because it's clearly like more political, more conceptual, mm-hmm. more you know artistic than a lot of the people that I've been talking to and stuff. How do you feel like you've been received and how is it viewed by your peers and really well, with a lot of respect, with a lot of admiration, slow, um, but grateful for the slowness because that allowed me to grow as an artist. Uh I would definitely say I feel the love way more now, like within the last year or so, I can feel that shift, that momentum of things being on my side and Uh people gravitating towards me and listening to the music and really liking it and respecting it. Because I'd say when I came in, I had a very like niche kind of cult following, but it was mine, it was small. Uh And um, And then they love it. Like you could ask them lot about Dear Daisy from 2014 when it dropped or like Kwame and Krumah or Bamboo or Gallons or any of them records and they'll give you a whole thesis. Like mm. people have written dissertations on those songs. Yeah, I found it interesting watching your videos and stuff because, you know, I'm so used to hearing about the struggle of black people in America. Mm. In England, it's a very different struggle, but I also feel like it, it might be... Uh, perceived differently by the audience because mm. the audience for hip hop out here might even be more white than yeah, yeah, yeah. than the American audience. Yeah, like, how do you feel that a lot of these like really, really pro-black messages or, or issues that, that you're exploring in your music, how it's received by the audience? And does it, does it sometimes stand out because a lot of the black dudes who make music in England seem like they're more interested in the perspective of just telling you about what's going on in their area and they're maybe not considering the, the full implications of what their blackness means towards their situation. 100%. I think that the, the internet makes the world smaller. Mm. And I think what it helped me realize is that the... Like when I made, so I made a project called 23 Winters. Um, I want to say it was 2015 or 2016 when I made that. I fully can't remember now, but um, might have been 2015. And um, that project was um, essentially about a conversation between me and my dad. And my dad um, essentially narrates the project. Mm. And you hear him talk about um, diaspora and moving to to England for the first time and the challenges he experienced. And then essentially what happened with the music is I would tell my story back to him as a result, almost like a cause and effect. Mm. You moved here and allowed me to start my life here. So these experiences you had when you was young are similar to mine, but it happened in a completely different space. Um, and, And that is now my first inclination into understanding Ghana. Mm. and taking that side of like my blackness into a consideration because I didn't speak the language. When my parents came over here, they taught me to, to I guess, assimilate. They wanted me to be normal mm. in, in, a, in a Western world. Um, and not being able to speak the language caused me to have a little bit of distance between how I understood myself. And that was, that was um, the narrative for a lot of the early parts of my music. Um, it was that confusion and that kind of like, I'm not sure. And then trying to explain that I'm not sure to a country that is predominantly white is difficult because like some of the imagery is a bit shocking. Some of the some of the messages or some of the things I'm like there was one video we did where it's just us like breaking into this house, tying this white guy up and like right. and like so, you saw that yeah, video. I think so, yeah. That video is about gentrification. You feel me? Like mm-hmm. Without like looking like without looking into it and all that stuff, you might just watch it and be like, "Why is he doing that?" And I'm like, "Because I grew up in this area. I've seen these houses pop up and seen who has to move out. Mm. You feel me? So I'm answering that in the in the video. I'm Have you seen that that take place like in the area where you grew up? All day. It's like, happening everywhere out here, huh? All day. Like I live in Hoxton. Like H O X T O N. Like that is the definition of gentrified. Like they got us first. We was number, we was out first. They got us first. They got us so quick, no one even cares. Really? Yeah. That's how, like, it was like, 
done. Now nah, shortage is just shortage. Right. You get me? But like anybody that's lived here for more than 10 years can tell you there's like, there's still, it's almost like I say it like, there's almost like ghosts of old Hoxton. Like if you walk through Hoxton, you'll still see like old painting, old painted adverts. Couple of relics that they forgot to get rid of. Yeah, like mm. old painted adverts for a local barber that's just on the corner. Right. Huge, but like everybody knew where dad's barbershop was. Yeah. And then you go there now and like, trust me, everybody knows where dad's barbershop was. And you go there now and it's the Bach. Right. <laughs> you know I, mean? like, I saw a man doing yoga in there the other day. Right. Like, I was like, rah. Imagine I've gone there one time and um, it was one of the most surreal experiences for me because yeah, I thought to myself, I now officially live in the middle ground of understanding what's going on, but living around people that don't understand what's going on. Mm. So I'm in this same cafe because so I thought, let me visit one of the ghosts of the area. Let's go to dad's barbershop, now known as the Bach, so I could eat some avocado mm. and sit in the sun. I'm sitting there, living my best life. I'm on FaceTime and, um, and like surrounded by tourists per se, if we're talking about the area. And... Um, some people bust around the corner, ballied up, about three men ballied up, one was shirtless, um, two on bikes, one was walking, but he was holding something. You couldn't see what he was holding. They've come onto to my road. I can't remember what shop it was that they took a picture outside of, but they took a picture to say, yeah, I'm on your strip. Right outside the cafe. Mm. With all these people just like, thinking it's like performance art. Mm. Like, like, like not a care in the world, yeah. Wow. But in, back in the day, you would see 50 men fly back up the strip to answer that. You get me? Like, in a heartbeat. But man, I just... Eating away. Right. But, you know, I'm really interested in that because it feels like the internet in a lot of ways killed the, the notion of there, in, at least in America, of there just being a whole <laughs> bunch of motherfuckers just out on the street yeah. hanging out. And because that is so threatening to the police, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially when they're black. The police yeah, yeah. do not like the idea of just people congregating. And I notice one even in, in, one thing that you guys have is great. You have a lot of shared spaces, a lot of mm -hmm. parks, a yeah. lot of like, you know, just random spots with a bunch of benches and stuff. Yeah. I feel like even that has been pushed out of America because yeah. they don't they know what happens when a bunch of people who live in the same area start to congregate, congregate yeah. they start to realize that they have a shared struggle and experience yeah, yeah, yeah. and that can be really bad for the establishment. The, comp the conspiracy was um, smoking in pubs. Someone said that to me, oh, they ban smoking in pubs because they know people go to pubs and they sit down and they talk and they talk about what's going on and yeah. they talk about the politics and they talk about the common man struggle and, and they galvanize. And there was like this. I don't want. I don't know, maybe it's not. Someone's probably gonna argue with me in the comment section and say it's not a conspiracy. It's true. Yeah. They banned it. They don't want us to talk. But like, it's true, man. Like, they all they they still do that. But at the end of the day, like, it's weird with England. London is almost its own country mm. in comparison to like the rest of England. No disrespect to anywhere else. I love like England. Like, there's other major cities that are have their own personality and they don't actually want to be London. Right. You get me? Men from Manchester that don't want to be London. Men from Birmingham don't want to be London. They have their own thing going on. They look like, at this place like it's a freak show. Yeah. Like, <laughs> or at like least all the shit that's happened to it over the past 10 years. Or whatever, it's yeah. too busy. No one's polite. Everyone's rushing about it. Yeah. Like it. Very like, different speed. Yeah. My brother, as soon as, once he was ready to settle down, he moved over to Birmingham. He's got a nice big house. Two beautiful kids, a wonderful wife, dog running about chilling this he is the rat it. race huh? this is yeah. the rat race yeah 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 it's <laughs> too know? much here he was over it right like, but um the, it, the the way that we think and feel over here is like you can't really do a madness like that it's too small we'll we'll, we'll, we'll find your door mm. we know where 10 Downing Street is <laughs> you know what I mean like right. that's a Google Maps thing and an Uber it's not it's not <laughs> we will pull up when, when you were a kid <laughs> when did you start to realise like that the area you grew up in was being gentrified because I don't even remember that word being in my vocabulary maybe until 10, 12, 15 years ago. I remember that yesterday. I was walking to secondary school. I think I might have been year nine. So I would have been about... How old are you in year nine? Like, when year nine, I think you're 14? Uh, yeah, 14. 14 yeah, about 14, 15. And I see them building Hoxton Station. And I was... <laughs> Can you imagine? I see them building a train station. And in my head, I thought to myself, that's weird. Sick now, obviously, love the train station. Overground is very efficient. Mm. Large up TFL sometimes. 
they get it wrong sometimes. They got it all the time. <laughs> but seeing that, let me know. There's, there's, it's almost like there's an influx of a something new that's about to come, and there's a change that you can't stop. Do you know what I mean? You kind of just got to watch it happen. And it happened. It took so long for it to be done that I used that as my benchmark. Soon as I saw that station being built, I used it as a reference point. Now, now there's no more um, like Jamaican shop. Now it's a Tesco. Now the hair shops are going away. Now, well, you get me like all of these little things. You start to just see it one by one where they're raising the rent. Mm. People can't afford to stay there no more, so they got a dip. Do you feel like you've fully seen the communities that you were around when you were young destroyed, broken up? Is that is that? definitely the vibe or there's still people who are left is, is the rent rent controlled around here to the extent where some people are able to continue yeah. to live there yeah, yeah, yeah people like like buying property in the 70s and the 80s was the smartest time to do it mm. so if you did it then big up yeah you're probably still in your head you probably sold the house somewhere and got a house somewhere else and yeah. made a shitload of money moved, yeah <laughs> it's either you're still there because you own the house right like I'm still in Hoxton we, we own the house mm. but um but like you, you might have either sold it and moved, you might not have, and then the rent got too crazy and you left. What's crazy though with with, with London, actually England, but London, because I'm from here, is when you're from an area, even if you move, it takes a long time for you to stop claiming your old area. Mm. You get me? Like, Hoxton Man in South, I still Hoxton Man in South. Right. You get me? They're not South Man all of a sudden. Yeah. You get me? Like, it takes a while, so... You kind of like in the back of your mind, you're still where you're from, right? Even if you go back there and it's all coffee shops. No, yeah, I, I've I've been out of the Boston area for like twenty years, and I still I could never wear a New York hat or LA really? hat or anything. I need like to that. go to Boston. I've got like I made a really really great friend from Boston, a really? comedian called Sam J. Okay, um, she's amazing, like really? absolutely amazing. She's from Boston, and we met at a comedy club in um, Soho, and like literally just been like. That's my my main G now. For Boston. Really? Yeah, yeah. Boston is if you're looking for working class, humble, down to earth yeah. people, it's a, it's a great place. I think that's why I like her comedy so much. Okay. Because it's very much just like how I imagine people would just talk to each other in uh-huh. Boston, just real relaxed and straightforward and to the point, no bullshit. I feel like I'm constantly dealing with the issue of people in California thinking that I'm being too aggressive in conversations yeah, well. because we're so used to just saying, shut the fuck up, you know, yeah, like, shut right. up. I, really, you know, I find just... that my accent changes when I get to America, though. Mm, really? You try to tone it down without even realizing? Yeah, like, I, like it's weird. Like, with you, I've used the normal slang man would use because mm. I know that you get it. Yeah. I get to LA and I feel like it's going to be a struggle. So it's all like, hello. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? I'm Koji. There is a lot Lovely of that. to meet you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No. Nah. Like, I don't blame you too because there's a lot of slang terms that I just <laughs> immediately stop using when it's, when I get out here just yeah. because I know that I don't fucking want to explain. But you know what? I, I like that. I like somebody who goes somewhere and just sticks to what they know yeah, or yeah. someone who gets famous and keeps saying the shit that they were yeah, saying before yeah. they got famous. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate that because then you're forcing everybody else to kind of to catch up with, with your, yeah. with your lingo. With I mean, language. like back in the day it was way harder. Like, like Americans didn't get English slang whatsoever. Like, and like some of it's a bit tricky cause you're not around it enough to clock onto the new one that might just come out yesterday. You mm. get me? But, um, nowadays, where the, the again, internet's made the world smaller. I was gonna say the internet is has made it so that people understand more. But then I also feel like the language. Or tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like sometimes the language in England has been toned down a bit because everybody's starting to slowly speak the same way because yeah. everybody's on the same internet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think once we clocked that the Canadian man was on our team as well, <laughs> it was like a little bit easier, isn't it? Like, yeah. Trey Mission, big up Trey Mission. He was the first man from Canada that I saw really bigging up the team. Yeah, right. Like, there you go. Honestly, like, Drake helped a lot of people start to understand yeah, a lot of the yeah. slang out here one way or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was crazy. I remember when that whole Drake thing started happening. It was, it was I was one of them purists, in it? I was one of them. Like, <laughs> now, Lao Arting, but now... now Big up Drake. Yeah. yeah. There you go. It's a little bit less explaining once you start charting your way around the world. Yeah, and it's like, big up. You got a song called 25 where you're yeah. talking about how a lot of your friends from growing up have passed away. What's like the, the main causes of that and what's that been like witnessing? Um, the roads is mad. Mm. Um, and pride kills a lot of people. And not just pride but like 
a lack of means that I think people underestimate. Do you know what I mean? So I think when people really have to do what they think they have to do, in the back of your mind, you're like, no, 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 they won't. But when push comes to shove, they will. Mm. And um, and I and I had to learn that slowly because there's people in your life that you go, yeah, I expect not expect that, but like you'll lose them and you go. I had a feeling, as much as I didn't want to, I was gonna lose my man at some point because he was living for the roads. Mm. And then it got to, I got to twenty five, and one of my best friends, um, an amazing person, his his name was Harry Yazoka. Um, a big big model like literally was doing bits all over the world like world famous as a model was in jail at one point come out changed his life mm. took over this modeling thing showed bare young black youths how to really make a living out of just being skinny mm. <laughs> you get me like like do you know what I mean skinny and pen because the genetics is there you yeah get me? Like, he gave man the blueprint to say yeah no matter where you're from do your thing people he met nothing but good energy do you see what I'm saying like he booked as much as he booked because he was a fantastic person and he got stabbed really start of is it has it been two years or one year I think it's been a year now it's mad because you know since it happened I've almost refused to kind of grieve about the, the situation I just write songs Mm. And every song is kind of fueled with this idea that seeing Harry go reminded me that my time on this planet is so temporary. Mm. Because if there was anybody that was promised the world, it was him. You feel me? Like the same week he got like taken or whatever, um, he booked a film. He was about to be an actor. He was about to be a big, big actor, bro. He was about to do red carpet and robes and fuck this shit up. You get me? Like if there's anybody, it was him. But like with that... It's mad. It's mad because I see him as like a real angel for man. Without Harry going, I would have never in a million years written 25, Water, 97, Pure, or this next project. And I guarantee that's all the music that's going to change my life. You get me? So yeah. I know that's H. Because H was the one when I made Bamboo, the UK didn't get me, bruv. Like they didn't get man. H got man. You get me? So... H was one of the people that was walking around saying to people, nah, Koji is special. He's not these other men. Oh. Koji is... He took his platform and helped me in certain areas. I remember I was trying to drop Bamboo. Nobody wanted it. All the UK blogs turned it down. This was back when blogs was like the thing. Mm -mm. You had to be on a blog, otherwise it was like... <sighs> I miss those days. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. None of them wanted it. They weren't feeling it. I've showed it to H at after one shoot. And, um, and he's lost his mind. He's called Charlie. He's like, yo, Charlie ended up being like my film producer from then till now. Do you know what I mean? And like helped me make half the visuals that like people have like gone crazy for, got awards for all of that stuff. Like it's mad. Like you make music as a way to express yourself. And for me making those records, none of those records are particularly sad songs because mm. Harry weren't a sad person. You get me? Like you celebrate life even when you lose it. So writing 25, writing 97, all of those bear tunes on the next project that's coming out, that's like, it's peak, man. Yeah, mm. well, those important stories to be told, you know? Mm. It's like, for somebody like me, to be able to understand through <coughs> the music what a young person out here is going through, I mean, that's like the, the ideal in a lot of ways is yeah. to be able to tell your story to people yeah, who yeah. don't even have a frame of reference for it. 100%, like, it's what, and do you, know what was, do you know what was matter about it? It was like, obviously, there's been a massive surge again in knife crime right so it was it was very frustrating to have to have the conversation about H's death in relation to the conversation around knife crime because they're I almost feel like that's one situation where a knife was used and then there's knife crime right you get me like, why, why do you say that though that makes it so different because like the knife crime that they're talking about on the news and all that kind of stuff they would love to have you believe that it's just this big gang called the knife gang yeah and do you know what i mean and they go outside with the knives and they knife people yeah and jump back in their knife mobile and run back to their their lair and we can't find them yeah no these are normal people driven to extremes and like sadly this is the way that they're they're handling it and like the 
the things that we had when we was younger that kind of let us know that thing is long don't exist no more you mm. get me and people always say it's as simple as like oh they shut down the youth clubs and da, 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 da. there's youth clubs youth clubs is definitely um a thing but it's olders it's the older generation mm. that could lift up a shirt and say look at this look i can't even piss properly come off the road blood like. mm. you get me we had that so there is there's a clear vision to say nah actually I might not be that you. You feel me? Now the internet makes everyone feel like they have to be that you. Mm. If you're not the one that can say they've dipped down a million man or boom, boom, boom. Who are you really? How are you supposed to get on Instagram live and beef people? Mm. If, you, if you ain't got no ops. So now you've got to go outside, find up. Like you get me and just create these like silly things for yourself. Like some of the youngers I'll see, I think to myself like, bruv, like, you're skilled, bruv. You could be a baller for real. Like, and this ain't even the age where you blame it on your knee going out. Your <laughs> knee's fine, bruv. Yeah. You get me? Like, like, it's mad, but like, there's loads of different things, man. There's loads of different things. And like, every time I read a story, my brain goes into mad speculation and conspiracy mode where I try to write the script before I read the story. Right. I need to stop doing that. No, I mean, it's incredible how, as much as we're aware of that dynamic, that where somebody has gone to jail or done something violent or whatever, that, I mean, that adds this element of, of sort of awe to their personality. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that I know who works near me, and I just found out that he just got out of jail. He did 17 years for an attempted right. murder. Right. And... I mean, I can't lie that the way I view this guy completely changed when I found that out, you know, in the sense that I and I, I feel dirty even saying that I like speak to him with more respect once I realize that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, in a, in a sense, that is true that it's like, you know, you have a level of respect of just knowing that somebody has been through something really harrowing. And that's yeah. even when kids get on terrible drugs, like what are they really doing it for? It's in part because their life is boring. Their life has no real dramatic arc and they're trying to add this element of that drama. That crazy in America right now. Oh yeah, super bad. What was, the, I saw one interview you did with um, Donk. Bunk. Bunk. Yeah. So my bad. <laughs> with Donk. Bunk. Yeah, Donk, no, my With Bunk and um, he was dribbling. And yeah. But must, you know, yeah, I heard he's all right. I seen him the other day. Yeah. I was at the arcade with my girl, and I see him. He, yeah, he seems cool, fine now. Yeah, but he got locked up for a little while too. I think oh, really? and he came out clean. I think. I think. Do you know what? I f like, I wonder what it is because it, it seems like people dying ain't enough. Yeah. To stop like really people jumping on it. <laughs> but you know what it is? Is that the 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 drug thing? People turn to drugs because they feel like their life is hopeless and pointless and that they have nothing to live for. Like mm -hmm. if you have all these good things and a strong family, etc., like things that you're excited about, then it's it's a lot harder to get addicted to drugs like that, but I feel like it really is an expression of how meaningless so many people feel like their lives are. Like I've heard people say that every country or every civilization gets the drugs that it deserves that it wants yeah, yeah. and that's okay you go to russia you see them with some of this shit that they're doing crocodile and stuff yeah, it's like crocodiles mad. Th their life is really so fucked up that they actually it's a, yeah. an even more literal expression of like i don't want to be here i don't want to live through this a part of me is a bit fucked up though because i want some people to take drugs yeah. so vice don't stop making them because <laughs> sometimes i just be chilling at home like yeah, let me watch some shit about crocodile. And right. You see some shit fall off somebody, and you look at your you look at your zoo, and you go, do you know, this is why. I'm yeah, this is alright. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I mean. You stick together, bro, because that don't happen when I hit this. Yeah, because <laughs> sometimes I will be thinking, I'm like, I gotta stop smoking weed. This shit is slowing me down. Nah, blah nah, blah nah, blah. You ain't lost a limb yeah. yet. <laughs> Trust me, the wrong crocodile potion, bro. It's all I bad. was in Russia. I seen the level of people that you will see just sitting on a park bench looking like they're about to die yeah, is like yeah. nothing i ever seen before yeah. in my life yeah even here which once you start once you go uni man you start to see all the drugs man mm. like ketamine's a mad one man it's crazy yeah it's yeah. big in la too is it mm. i don't get ketamine i never tried it yeah it's horse tranquilizer yeah i feel kind of lame when like there's all these cool new drugs people are talking about and i don't really have like a frame of reference for it like they i never get that to horses to put them to sleep yeah and men are taking that to go out Tranquilizer. I mean, that sounds kind of fun, but I don't know. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you ever see what happens to a horse when they shove that thing in them? <laughs> if they had a limitless pill, I'll take that every day. Yeah. 
So where are you at in terms of future releases? You got all the stuff out right now, but I know you, yeah. you definitely have new shit in the works. And let's not yeah. just limit it to music either, because I'm sure you yeah, got all kinds yeah. of shit. I'm trying to, what, when does this drop though? Uh, probably next couple of days. Um, I don't know. All right, well, basically what I can talk about is the new project. Oh. Um, two years out, the last project I made, In God's Body, long story short, went through hell of shit. Mm very deep in a depression that basically meant I just didn't feel the point in doing anything creative anymore. Had to work myself out of that mentally, emotionally, financially. Um, and I got back to a space where um, I was cool to wear both hats mm. because I found that like, like me as a person, I was low. I was depressed. I understood Koji as, as a, a thing for other people. So as soon as I walked out the door, I could wear the smile and do the job. And I got back in and I isolated myself from everything and everyone. And um, and it took me a while to kind of come to grips with that, especially after losing H and all that stuff. Like, it took a minute. And then um, I found myself in a better position um, with a better outlook, um, understanding certain things aren't necessarily weaknesses. Um, and just and just choosing more methods of healing um and one of those things was making music and for me i think the coolest thing about this project was like it almost felt like some like 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 a holy ghost had hit us on some crazy sh like it was me swindle kz who's been producing for me since the very beginning he's one of the best in the world swindle's one of the best in the world q out of paris 404 human family best in the world some musicians um neil like dana like just people that just could feel music and we made this project pretty quickly because mm. i'm one of them obsessive compulsive creatives that needs to like go over then go over then go over and go over again we made this one fairly quickly but because everything felt right mm. and you could tell making this project was almost like therapy for everybody in the room um and then then we made that project we made the project in february you, you step out into the world now after coming out of the studio of making some great stuff and your spirits are on high mm. and now you're releasing and you gotta watch for this metric and that metric mm. and this and um see how much people enjoyed your your personal struggle yeah, exactly. <laughs> how much do y'all relate exactly. to my depression and it's like and it's like the enjoyment doesn't come from hearing it. Once you hear it, you enjoy it too. It's how do we get people to hear it? So it's like, you, you got to run that race for a bit. So originally we was going to drop much earlier in the year. And then I was like, do you know what? Let's enjoy this summer. Like I've got a bunch of festivals, the tours planned, the project can come at a press of a button. Do you know what I mean? So it's going to come. Like that's, that's the fun I've been having is letting people know I've got the best one this year. Mm. Well, there you go. I'm looking forward to it, man. Uh, what kind of shoes are those? Lubes. Nice. Yeah, lubies. Just knowing that you're big on the fashion thing, I was just looking at those thinking, you know, those look pretty fucking comfortable and pretty Do you know stylish. what? They, I'm not normally a, a shoe guy. Um, big up Louboutin. I got a chance to meet him. Really? Speak with him. Yeah, man. Um, big up Manny. She's on the Louboutin team as well. Oh, nice. They're just, they're just like, they're bringing men through. <laughs> Much respect. I've been wearing the same pair of running shoes for three weeks on this road trip. I don't know why I only bought one pair of shoes. Listen, if you only need one, wear one. Yeah. Literally, like that's the difference in it. Like it's crazy because as soon as you start making money, you figure out buy less shoes. ways to spend it. A lot of people just buy a lot of shoes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just I, think I, of dumb ways to spend it or less ways to spend I, it. I got a friend, uh, Tax Stone, who's who's locked up right now. But I, I remember, but you know, Tax before he got locked up, I just remember him like going on a rant one time and saying like. Y'all motherfuckers put in all this work. You get locked up. And what you get to show for it? A bunch of jeans. <laughs> and I was like, that's so true. Like, I know a lot of people that have like $10,000 worth of jeans in their house. And oh, that, that's no. about it. That's yeah. about it. <laughs> I mean, that's literally it. You know? in, the, in the drawer from Ikea. Yeah. Do you know what I Real mean? talk. It's like yeah. The balance is, is the, off. If the couch is 150 bucks from Ikea and then yeah. the, the shoes are, are $1,500 or the jeans are $1,500, you might... Want to read? Yeah, there's priorities. a balance. But at the same time, respect for doing doing big. And big uh, up IKEA. Yeah, and big up IKEA. Yeah, all the fuck Sweden as well. 
Yeah, right now. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Unless I'm there. Unless they free rock you, at which point I'd like to withdraw my comment. Don't rest no. me, sweetie. <laughs> I can't afford to do yeah. shows. Like. Listen, <laughs> customs agent. We're just Yo, kidding. Yeah. They, oh, man, I was vexed, man. He couldn't do wireless, man. Oh, yeah, that's a shame. And you know the ones where actually, as you're sitting in there, you know when you actually feel for man? Because I know as an artist, there's certain shows that you have there that you're mm. like, let them do whatever. If they want money, I'll pay whatever. Right. Let me go do that. Go play in front of a hundred thousand people like yeah. that is crazy. Even yeah, for somebody like, as big as him, you know he appreciates that shit of still. Course, yeah. Man. Especially in London, man. He's got like he's got love for London, man. Mm. rocky has got love, and that's the thing. I'm not even saying that because I've met him. Like he's one of the people I ain't even met yet. Like opportunity's been there, but I've just not met him yet. But I can tell from all the situations and the times that I've been around him or the people that I know, he's got a love for London. Mm. Um. He's just got a lot of New York in him. And it don't matter where in the world that he is. Anybody can get it. Anybody can get it. <laughs> Man. Oh, all right, Koji. Honestly, great ca- uh, conversation. Probably yeah. one of the best ones I had so far. Pleasure. Appreciate you, man. Thank, Thank you, man. for real. Everybody, uh, check his shit out on YouTube, Boom. Apple Music, Spotify, all that right, shit. Everything. Let's go. Right there. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes.